Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the show, The 10,000 Heroes Show. I'm your host, Ankur Shah Delight, and I have a real treat for you today. It's an interview with Somia Sadiq, a new friend of mine, after this interview. And she's amazing, and there's many amazing things that we talk about, and was, I, I found it just hilarious, even rewatching it. But I want to highlight something for you before we jump into the episode, which is that Somia identifies as a peace builder. That's what she dedicates her life to. She does a lot of facilitation, conflict resolution. And the, th the thing that I want you to focus on is her attitude and her language. Because all the topics are important and all the content is important. And there's a lot of expertise. She's a subject matter expert in this area. But what I find most, um, what I treasure most is her approach and the care with which she uses words and her general attitude and just absorbing that that's what i did i absorbed that and i hope you absorb that in this in watching this episode all right let's roll somia welcome to the show thank you so much and i just re-watched a presentation you sent me that you gave to this architects association in mm -hmm. the saskatchewan Is yeah that, saskatchewan yeah. saskatchewan yeah so, and I just thought it'd be appropriate to to start with that, like, I mean, it's, it's a joke now, but like, it wasn't a joke for so long. So it's like, Somia, well, that's an interesting name. Where are you from? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that gets me. That's good. <laughs> that's a good start. Yeah. So if I, oh, this is, this is great. Didn't see that coming. So if you ask my parents where my name comes from, you'll get different answers. But, and over the years, I ask the question every now and then to see if the answer changes. Uh, my understanding, my current understanding of what my name means is the type of resilience that comes from fasting. And the name oh. has Persian roots. There's some Arab roots. Um, and I love the meaning of that because resilience is important to me personally. Um, but what's also interesting is one time my dad was telling me this and, you know, it's sort of this like deep, meaningful moment we're having. And I'm just like, wow, what a beautiful name. And thank you so much. And my mom says, I think it was just his girlfriend, last girlfriend's name. That's why you have this name. <laughs> so, Sick you know, word. I don't know what the truth is, but I like both versions of that story. Yeah, beautiful. And yeah. Your, yeah, and your family has roots in Pakistan or yeah, or yeah. Indian so my family, or? yeah, so my family has roots in Punjab and Kashmir. So pre partition, uh, in the Punjab area, uh, my family was uh, on both sides of the border, and then there was a lot of movement during the partition yeah. era. Um, including lots of tragedy, as most families who were alive at the time could attest to. And similarly, uh, during partition, lots of family up in Kashmir, where people also were experiencing a lot of chaos and movement. So Punjab and Kashmir are my roots. I um, I like to say, from my mom's side, I come from the land of mountain goats. And then from my dad's side, I come from the land, from the land of just badass goats. So I just come from the land of a lot of goats. It's like that's that's my homeland. Right. Yeah. A lot of a lot of goat goat love. Goat uh, love. Yeah. And have you ever just because it's Ramadan right now? Are you mm -hmm. currently fasting for Ramadan, or have you ever fasted for Ramadan? I am not fasting today, but I do fast for Ramadan. Okay. And so maybe you can tell us a little bit from your personal experience. Um, what is the resilience that comes from fasting? Mm. What does it feel like? Oh, good question. So um, I think there's there's so many different aspects to it. One, there is the deliberate, there's lots of rituals associated with the um, the fasting process. Like we would wake up, we would um, um, eat before, before Fajr, um, the ritual of prayer and everything else that goes with it, everything from doing wudu to actually praying. Um, there's a strong, deep, meditative, gratitude expression element to that. And you're doing that before the sun comes up. So there's just like a really powerful um, 
yeah, powerful, I think, grounding that happens in that exercise, which, as we know, like meditation and grounding plays a very strong role in building resilience and improving our mental health, mental well-being, just building awareness of the surroundings. So there's that element. And then throughout the day, there are all these moments where like you're hungry, you're not eating, you're not drinking water. Uh, and there's an element of, uh, you know, spiritual connectedness that's really important um, during the course of the day. So you're find, finding yourself constantly pacing and watching your reactions, watching how you how you respond to situations. And I think there's a very strong element of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I think pacing, like it comes, it's practiced patience. And you do that like 29, 30 days in a row. And so pa you're pacing, pacing meaning I'm going to be really careful about how I spend my energy because I know I'm going to run out like that, that kind of pacing. No, it's more um, like when we, when we think about the purpose of fasting, like it's meant to be reflective, contemplative. It's meant to really ground you in who you are. It's meant to give you space to express gratitude for creation, gratitude for what you have, gratitude for abundance. So with that, there's the expectation, you know, thinking back to how my parents would talk about it is you can't get into fights. If you get angry, you can't just yell, like really watch yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is a special month. And you're doing this special act. So you're encouraged not to just say awful things. Even if you think of them, you're like, no, no, I'm I'm fasting. I can't, I can't just be mean to people. Not that you would go around being mean to people, but you're being very deliberate about those. Yeah. So that's the kind of pacing that happens. You have to watch your reaction just because you're fasting. So it's a good, yeah good training ground like 30 days in a row to try to do that like that's good practice yeah but there's this like interesting dynamic in that from my from my experience at least in fasting not having food and then water is even harder mm -hmm. tends to make us more irritable and so it's like it's like more likely that we're going to have those outbursts and we have to be even more even careful. more careful absolutely yeah. And then you know that that's going to happen. So that's part of the process is, you know, you're going to be hangry. You know, you're going to have less energy. So how do you, how do you manage status quo and meet all of the expectations of the world around you while having this internal conversation about your place in the world and your place in the universe and so on. So it's, it's a really humbling exercise. And I think that's where the resilience comes from. Yeah. So you've, you've built a lot of Somia in your life. Apparently, through this, through this <laughs> I could do better. I could do better. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, working on it. Okay, second question, and this is this is the follow up on my my fun little where are you from comment, uh, <laughs> which I also sure. love getting. Uh, so in in that address, I heard you mm -hmm. use these words that I've heard a little bit, but I've never had them defined. And I bet if I ask some normal person to define them. It wouldn't be as fun as if I asked you to define them. So I'm going to ask you, settler and newcomer. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> what is with all these tough questions? I like this. <laughs> um, okay, so in the... And you define, you, you introduce yourself as a settler and a newcomer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and a newcomer. So within the context of Canada individuals came groups came and settled in canada as in um you know settled on lands here became a part of the uh, uh part of the social economic political fabric had influence over time um and made canada their home so in my mind that's that's sort of the definition of a settler like you move from a different place you come here you settle here this is now home uh, i also identify myself as a newcomer one because i've only been in canada well came in 2002 so it's been been quite some time um but in my in my world 
I think the newcomer identity is very much an identity of people who've come in the last couple of decades to Canada, people who've come from um, people of color who've come to Canada, people who've uh, immigrated to Canada. So it's a bit of a different, not quite different, but it's a bit of a layer on that identity, if you will, in addition to being a settler, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I know, you know, just from your work and the importance of stories, which we're going to get to, mm -hmm. the stories are important and words are important. So mm -hmm. why do you use the word newcomer and not immigrant? Like what are, what are the different connotations? Yeah, like I think for me, for me personally, the difference is um, when I think of someone who immigrated, um, there's a what status you had when you entered Canada conversation. So we have a difference between immigrants and refugees, for example, and both of those fall under, in my mind, both of them fall under the category of newcomers. Mm -hmm. So immigrants, um, immigrants are individuals who have made the choice for all sorts of reasons to leave their home country, to move into a different country and immigrate and settle in a different country. Whereas refugees, there's an element of choice that's missing. There's an element of agency that's missing. Yeah. So both of those they're, but fall they're both under newcomers. the category of newcomers. Yeah. Okay. So we can't, when we think of, um, you know, how we build, how we nurture peace, we have to be aware of that nuance that there might have been a little bit more choice um, with immigrants as opposed to refugees, but everyone has their own story and what we think is choice might not be choice for someone else. Yeah. And this, and thank you for this education. You know, I, I didn't, this is not what I thought we would talk about, but it's helpful for me. And, and I, and I, I just, I just had a great conversation with a friend of mine on this hike that was a, about, some of it was about language and some of it was about, mm -hmm. Uh, I guess, identity politics in general, or just right. understanding identities. And I could see that he, he's, he's a white dude I went to college with, that he is feeling a lot of judgment in, right. in this world. And I noticed mm -hmm. when you said the word settler, you weren't, you weren't like, you said nothing about murder or genocide or colonialism or the boarding schools or any of that shit. Yep. Um, so like, were you intentionally trying to denature that word from judgment or is it linked in your mind to like, oh, all the stuff the settlers did was really bad and we should all like know about that? Because you didn't, well, good you didn't question. reflect that yeah. way at all. No. And I think like I, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a peace builder, which, you know, requires me to approach any definitions with a lot of compassion and understanding and an opportunity to create more conversation around it as opposed to me putting it in a box and saying, well, this is what it means. This is who settlers are. There's, when we think about um, what it means to be a settler in the context of Canadian history, both of the multiple things can be true at the same time. And that in my world lies at the heart of how we build peace is Yes, um, yes, settlers have caused a lot of harm. There's a lot of harm that's been caused to Indigenous peoples by, by the church, by government policies, and still is to this day. Um, so that is absolutely true. What is also true is that there are uh, individuals who, communities who identify as settlers who are trying to build towards, walk towards reconciliation. That is also true. What is also true is there are folks who are trying and failing, and then there's folks who are not trying at all. So all of those things concurrently can be true. So there's so much nuance to a settler identity. And if you ask different people, what does it mean to you to be a settler? I bet you, you would get this like absolutely incredible diversity of opinions for what it means for some there's shame associated with being a settler because mm. of this realization that wait a second my parents my grandparents land that was literally taken away from others or um i as a as a settler when i was in school um the only reason i didn't see any indigenous kids were because they were in residential schools and these horrible things were happening to them so all of those things can be very much a part of that settler identity. So 
I think the deeper the conversation goes, the more those nuances would emerge. But yeah, on the surface, in my mind, there's a settler identity, which is very closely tied to colonization, to harms done. But that would be a deeper conversation as we're having now. Yeah, yeah. And is this is that a part of an active part of your work with peace building? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if if you yeah. if you talk to someone, um, I don't. Uh, I'm trying to think if I feel this way. I don't. You feel I don't. how you feel. Yeah, I don't. I don't <laughs> feel this way. So I can't accurately represent it. But I have really good friends who who are like they experience a lot of guilt mm -hmm. over things that they did not do right but, but their perhaps ancestors did um i actually sure. have no concept of what my ancestors did you know it's not like right. my ancestors were in india i don't know the kind of horrible shit they were doing to the indigenous people there but given given that how no. adivasis are treated now it's like not hard to imagine what was going on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but like you know i have no idea it's not like my per my family's history is like involved in the history of slavery where it's just like so obvious to everyone all of right. this shit that went down for hundreds of years and how everyone is really everyone in the u.s is a culture it's part of our cultural inheritance but how mm -hmm. how do you work with that in a conversation these two realities of like okay we all benefit from that like i benefit from the privilege mm -hmm. of what happened with that yep. you know, both in india and yep. here um and both me and putting on my hat of my like my kind of white settler friend here um mm -hmm. we're not directly responsible and how how do you right. like help us feel the presence and the weight of that without the crippling guilt of it yeah what a great question Uncle. appreciate it few few thoughts that come to mind one um, I do a lot of work in the space of, uh, you know, trauma awareness and dialogue and trauma awareness and how we understand impacts and trauma awareness and how we build peace, nurture peace and so on. One of the one of the key principles there is awareness and acknowledgement. And that's where we always encourage starting with. Right. So if if you and I are having a conversation and say, like, we're reflecting on Pakistan, India separation time, um, it's totally possible that my family caused a lot of violence. I don't know, right? And it's totally possible that your family did. And it's also possible that our collective families were, I don't know, saving lives. But what's also possible is that they were hurting people and saving lives at the same time. So again, all of those, the, mul the multiple truths can coexist. So how do we reconcile all of that is we create space for those conversations to happen. We create space for truth to be shared, truth to be told, truth to emerge. So a lot of the work that um, um, I'm deeply, deeply honored to be a part of in, in Canada is working with Indigenous communities as survivors of the Indian residential school system talk about what has happened to them. So this is testimony gathering from what Horrible, horrible things happen to survivors in schools. So we're creating space, we're holding space for those testimonies to emerge. And that is one part of the conversation is let's acknowledge that some bad shit went down. Yeah. And let's acknowledge that that laid the foundation of many, many other things. So for those who are listening, um, who may experience guilt and shame, uh, those are also very very real, very valid things to feel. Of course, you'll feel guilt. Of course, you'll feel shame. And I think step one is to accept that that is the case. Yes, I am feeling guilt. Yes, I'm feeling shame. And then ask yourself, why am I feeling guilt? And why am I feeling shame? And think about that a little bit. And then think about, okay, well, what can I do about this guilt and shame? Because if we just sit with guilt and shame, well, that's not going to help anybody. If anything, we're probably going to end up making some really bad choices because we're just feeling all this guilt and this shame and don't know what to do with it. But then taking that a step further to say, what can I do? Great. Now we're actually having some movement. Now we're walking on that path of reconciliation. So I think acknowledging it is step one. Yeah. Yeah. 
I like hearing that. It makes it makes me think of of just national governments. And I got I I feel a lot of power in 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 a leader just just ma just making a public apology. Like there's this talk about like reparations mm -hmm. in in the US and I don't know really anything about that except the name and the you know the highlights. Mm -hmm. But for me it would just mean so much for for the leadership to just talk about how bad they feel about slavery you know yeah. or for the leadership to be like god the declaration of independence was really amazing but it was it had this like real flaw in the fact that it, like implicitly acknowledged slavery and i just i don't i, I wish i wish we had done a better job with that you know it just, just yeah. this is, for me it's like i don't know maybe there has to be like billions of dollars transferred in some way too but i i feel like that would go a long way Spiritual. Yeah, there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of power in in apology, only if it comes from a good place, though. And I say that oh, there, that's just such a big topic in my head. Um, but a few a few thoughts that come to mind are you know when we're thinking about an apology, if if we were arguing about something, and if you know you had wronged me. And without even a conversation, I, you just say, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I kind of still want to fight. I want to know what you're apologizing for. And do you really mean it? So there's so much more. There's the word, I'm sorry. And then there's so much more around it that can carry it to make it more meaningful, right? Yeah. So you so, got, you got the yeah. outcome that you're supposed to want. You got the apology, but you have some like fundamental need that is still not met. If I'm just like, yeah. oh, 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 I'm sorry. And and what yeah, is that? And what is that need? That need is process. That need is dialogue. That need is I want to hear it. I want to be a part of. Like, there's this concept of mutuality that we talk about when we talk about doing, you know, work in a trauma informed way. And to me, mutuality is if one of us is apologizing, let's. Let's take a little bit of time for me to explain what I feel bad about, what it is that I'm apologizing for, so that you can hear beyond just the word, I'm sorry, so that we can feel in that moment together what this means. And that would naturally lead to the conversation of, you know, what does reparation look like and so on. I won't do this again or whatever that means. But there's there's process there because when you apologize, there's humility in an apology. There's vulnerability in an apology. There's a giving up of power in an apology. And for the other person who's being apologized to, there's a reclaiming of agency, a reclaiming of power, reclaiming of place and relationality. So an apology that just has nothing else attached to it just won't go a long way. So apologize, yes, but there needs to be process and meaning attached to it. Okay, so my background's in math. Um, so like I um, I need a formula. Uh, <laughs> can we come up with a little formula together? And I was never good at math, so good luck to you. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and coax. take this and attach some numbers to it. Well, <laughs> I'll that, leave that with you. That's the great thing about math, especially the more advanced math. You don't you don't even need the numbers. It's yeah. just it's, it's, it's <laughs> the relationship between the concepts. So, but for this case, you're like, okay, for this apology to work, you can't be performative. It's like no. you don't want to just say the words. For it to work, no. it has these like necessary conditions and one of them i'm hearing is a kind of like slowness it's not like if i just rush through it just just to get to the next thing mm -hmm. like oh sorry about that baby can we go back to our date it's yeah. not gonna land well no no that won't go well yeah so there's like a slowness and also um like I any think intentionality so not not so much slowness as because as, as soon as you said slowness i was thinking oh there are people who are gonna be like you know, you've, you've harmed us for 150 years and you're going to be slow about the apology. So <laughs> I think it's not so much slowness, it's intentionality. Okay, intentionality. I think that is what is important. So, you know, as an example, 
the again lots of conversations in Canada about the Pope must apologize to what has happened to Indigenous peoples and um, like recognize it as genocide and um, like straight up apologize. So we've we've been a part of a lot of these conversations, observing you know how the public discourse is evolving, where people are asking for an apology. So when people are already asking for an apology the apology must come. So the slowness is not as relevant in that case. What's important is what's attached to the policy. What is the intentionality behind the apology? What are you apologizing for? Because that's where you accept. And that is hard. It's probably harder than the apology is to accept that you've wronged someone. Yeah. So that's, that's an important part of the formula is like actual mm -hmm. acceptance of harm. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Which, which the first thing that comes to me there is this, you used the word mutuality a little while ago. It's this like really being bound together. Like if mm -hmm. I harmed you, then we're just, we're like, we're in it together. Mm -hmm. We cannot extricate ourselves from this relationship. And that's a yeah. powerful acceptance as, as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, apologies are important, very important to me moving forward are you are you are you would you like to move topics or could we stay on this apology thing because i'm like no this is good it. this yeah right. no so please, there's the intentionality yeah. there's the awareness acknowledgement of harm there's also w w would you say something like regret or like if i if i just acknowledge that i harmed you and i'm like and i'd do it again hmm. is that where's that or like, and you know, let's say Oppenheimer. I just watched that movie, so it's on my mind. Mm -hmm. It's like, hom homie's like, I invented the bomb. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I see. It's like, oh, this is this is bad. But yeah. But there's also like a really compelling argument. I don't know what he would say, but there's mm -hmm. a compelling argument to be like, I would probably do it again. Right. Because the the thought was, if I don't do this, Hitler's going to do this, and like, like, uh, it's it's not a great choice, it's not a great option. It's like I wish mm -hmm. I I wish yeah. I had other choices than I make the bomb or Hitler makes the bomb. But this is what I got, and so maybe I'll do it again. Is it right. an apology? Yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> you'd have to ask him how he feels about the apology. But I think so. Regret, yeah, regret is a. I don't know if I would peg it as regret or remorse, but in my mind, whatever you call it will emerge from that conversation about what it is that you're apologizing for. Like if 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 I have been wronged, I want to hear more than I want to hear, I want to know that you're feeling bad about it, that you actually feel feel like you've hurt someone. Yeah, And I would also welcome hearing how it impacted you. So quick, quick story here. Ooh, I love that. Um, my, um, uh, my Miyagi great grandfather, and this is sort of why I love stories and storytelling and story listening. My, my elders were these very, um, like, for lack of a better term, mediators, if you will, in com in community. So they were folks who were really well respected. These are individuals who anyone having a conflict about anything would come to for for guidance and for understanding, help us resolve this conflict. And it was a very organic process that evolved sometimes over days. So people would just come to the family house. Everybody would set up shop in the courtyard. Their charpai will be on the rooftop and they would stay for as long as they needed to while people were talking about what had transpired. How, how Miyagi, my great grandfather, would, um, and this is one particular uh, conflict that I that comes to mind, how he would navigate that is so you would have folks on who had been wronged. Um, and in this case, it was about, I think it was about a water buffalo that had been stolen. So there's people who are owners of the water buffalo. And then on the other side, the folks who had been accused of stealing. And, and then there were other a bunch of other community members who participated in the process. They had just made the trek to be a part of it, probably some out of curiosity. 
some because <laughs> they've been impacted in some way, right? So as, and this happened over four days, the, the process was asking, how have you been wronged? And then everybody would chime in. And then how has this impacted you? Everybody would chime in, including those who were accused of stealing. Like, How has this conflict impacted you? And then what should, what should the repercussions be? What are the consequences of this? Great, everybody chimes in. Now let's hear about the impact of that consequence. So if there's a punishment, how is that going to impact everybody? And a lot of the times, just that question would reduce the punishment, if you will, it would, because it would foster empathy, cohesion building in community and so many other things. And all of this happened over days, lots of random stories about all sorts of things would emerge. People would still eat together, uh, have chai together. Like there was lots of community cohesion that would happen in the process of trying to find a resolution to a conflict. So the apology then, to bring it back to apology, is the apology is in the opportunity to hear about how this has impacted you and how it's impacted the person and what it means to you. So like apology on steroids, really Cadillac version of apology when you do a process properly and do it right. Wow. It's for the, the person giving the apology to really hear the impact of their action on everyone involved. And for, I mean, for everyone to hear the impact of it mm. for everyone involved. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man, and there's probably is. a healing power there, right? Yeah. For even the person who has wronged. Yes. Um, like the the power of, okay, I, I have said my apology. I've explained how I feel. I have said it all. And yes, of course, I might still live with guilt and shame and so on. But imagine not even having that opportunity to express. So there's a lot of healing power in an apology done an apology done right yeah i mean I, I'm, the word that's coming to mind is liberation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for everyone wow. involved is that part of what you have you done things like that have you witnessed that yeah yeah that's part of a lot of the a lot of the peace building work that uh that i'm involved and engaged in like there's lots of facilitated dialogue lots of people coming together to share testimony to talk about impacts um, I've, uh, in the context of some of the work in Canada, looking at, uh, you know, the psycho, psychological, sociological impacts of, um, whether it's projects or plans or policies and how those would impact people, but ultimately creating a lot of space for, for dialogue and conversation so people can hear what, um, yeah, what the repercussions of anything would look like. Yeah, so that, if I'm understanding you correctly, is doing it like before it happens. Just getting like, if we're going to plan something, let's understand how it's going to affect everybody. So we don't yeah. have to go through this whole ex post facto apology thing. Yeah, and in some cases, after the fact, so some of um, some of my work, some of our work um, is in residential school investigations. So in that case, it is after the fact, uh, and not quite after the fact, because there are still very much active policies and legislation that are continuing to mm. cause harm to Indigenous peoples. So it's very much an uh, ongoing conversation about ongoing impacts as opposed to after the fact. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Just hearing your story about your great grandparents, it's like, I really want to get some career advice from them. Because <laughs> that's what I want to do. I just yeah. want to do well, they're that. In the, they're in the, they're all in the spirit world now, so I get a lot of guidance. I think just by having having been in their company and learning from them. God, it's so beautiful. It reminds me. I just read, and I think I'll do a podcast episode on it. The Third Side by mm -hmm. William Urey. Have you read that one? No. Third so, Side. Yeah. Like so William Urey, he's the um, he's the guy that wrote Getting to Yes. And so he's oh, like yeah. a career uh, mediator, negotiator. But what I didn't realize is that he's an anthropologist by training. And mm. so a lot of the third side is kind of from his anthropological studies 
of these different groups all around the world that had a very different approach to conflict. And it's mm -hmm. much more aligned with the story from your great grandparents, where when there's a conflict, they just gather everybody in the whole band or whatever the community size mm -hmm. was and sit down in a circle for as long as it takes to work it out. And the rule is like, nobody, nobody gets up. Yeah. Nobody, nobody in this village is going to get up and do their normal things until we work this out. That's amazing. I, I, that excites me so much. Like that's, that work is so important to me. I, I believe very strongly in for any conflict in any conflict, when we're trying to resolve it or transform it process will never feel fair unless there's some part of the process that tugs on our identity. So what I mean by that is if you if you grew up like so, you know, taking my example, like I grew up in this very dialogue heavy um, process. So if I'm in conflict in a different geography, in a different setting, and the only approach to resolution is a judge in a robe who's going to say yes or no, and I'm going to get all of eight seconds of hearing the judge's voice. I'm, I don't think I will feel like this has been fair in any shape or form. Like that, because that process is not familiar to me. It doesn't, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't pull into any aspects of my identity. So for any process to be successful, it has to pull into what we talk about. So for me, this idea of a bit of a resurgence of um, indigenous understandings of conflict transformation, like we've always had conflict. And we have always found creative, consensus-based, or other ways of resolving conflict in communities. Everything from individuals to families to communities to cities, towns, villages. Like we've we've found ways to move forward. Humans are very resilient. So I'm very intrigued by, and very much actively always finding ways to create space for for that resurgence too to happen in communities. And I think it's just so important for people to be able to resolve conflict in a manner that's familiar to them. Yeah. Yeah. One, one, one of the things I really liked about that too is, you know, the book is called the third side. So it's like in every mm -hmm. conflict, there's two sides, you know, it's party A, party B, but there's also the third side, which is the community. You know, the community is the right. context of that conflict and that community on mass is the third side. And they are the, a conflict management system that helps mm -hmm. that helps apply this this methodology and we're all part of that and you know i'm always talking about purpose and thinking about purpose and trying to figure out what i'm gonna do when i grow up and all this stuff and it just it was like wow if we all had this recognition that no matter what else we do whether we work as an ota in the school district or a baker or an ai software engineer that really, when a conflict breaks out, we're we're on duty as mm -hmm. part of the third side to help anyone we're connected with resolve it. I mm. feel like we'd all walk around with a lot more meaning, and like our connections with people would would just be more present and meaningful in our lives. Because it's like, dude, we're all it's like we're we're all deputized mm -hmm. by the simple fact of having relationships as being on this third side. Yeah, that's beautiful. I really like that. That resonates big time. We we think about community readiness in so many different contexts when we're uh, thinking about, you know, how do individuals who've had um, individuals who've been radicalized and then de-radicalized, what does their reintegration into society look like? Or someone who's um, yeah, really just anyone, what does that reintegration look like? And a huge part of that conversation is the is the society is the society ready? Is the community ready to accept this person back into the community? So I love that the preventative aspect of the third side, oh, because yeah. why not be ready before shit hits the fan? Like yeah. let's let's support each other before we get there. Yeah. To me, that is positive peace building. Like that's really awesome. Yeah, like really early on in the, mm -hmm. in the in the thing. And as as again, as he says in the, I'm just like 
getting all the best parts of this podcast I'm going to do, but we'll just do it right now. The He has a quote from Lao Tzu, which is like, do the hard thing while it's still easy. Oh, ooh, I like it. And it's that. It's like, if you can do, yeah. if you can set up your infrastructure for building relationships, then the conflict transformation or conflict management or conflict resolution piece, it's like written mm -hmm. itself. Yeah. Oh, see, but that's not fashionable, right? Like it's so much more fashionable to go in with guns and weapons and we fix this as opposed to doing all the work beforehand and finding ways to connect proactively. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even for me as a, as a mediator, like my fantasy, I don't have the gun fantasy, but I do have this fantasy of like going into this conflict room and I'm not going to. I'm going to say such brilliant things that this shit is going to stop, <laughs> you know? It's it's the same fantasy. I have heard <laughs> enough. <laughs> you shall now stop fighting. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. Yeah. And the and the one the one thing just so, and we can move on after this, but uh no, it's great. It is he he quotes another another group they're called I think they're called the Semai people. I think they're from um Malaysia. And mm. in that culture, it's very, very strongly held that choosing sides in a conflict is absolutely unethical. Oh, and the, wow. The responsibility of the community is not to take sides. And if you're taking sides, you're just aggravating the conflict. And your your role is to like be there in the circle with people doing exactly what your you know grandparents were doing and just like, how does this impact everyone? What does everyone think? How would that impact you? What, what That whole thing. But any effort you put towards, well, Jimmy's right, is just yeah. is not helpful at all to that process. And they've like codified that as like everyone knows taking sides is not the right thing to do. Wow. How do you feel about implementing that in the United States? Uh there's just many levels. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually just submitted um, a proposal to my local city council for a program that we, we chose to call Democracy Dialogues. I think, honestly, mm. it could be called any number of things. But the idea, and so here's my attempt to answer that, and I'd love your, um, mm -hmm. your, your critique of this, really, is we li I live in a small rural town. It's actually kind of interesting that my county has voted with the winner of the US presidential election for the past mm. 70 or 80 years, which is to say that it's like pretty close split down the middle between ideological right. positions, right? Interesting. And I, my personal sense, I mean, this is my experience, and I think this is a common experience, is that there's all these issues in our global political world that affect our community, our local community, really negatively. And these are not issues that we have um, a lot of say over. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna pick pick something specific that's, that's quite controversial, uh, just because it's on my mind. And it's probably a bad decision to do this, but here I am. There was there was a proposal for the city to make a resolution about like the ceasefire, like wanting a ceasefire in Gaza, and. I've actually, okay, so my, my position was like, that's kind of a waste of time. The city is not in charge mm. of anything. The city's not contributing like military aid to Palestine or Israel. The city's not the UN. The city's not the ICJ. Like what, what? I've heard arguments that like, it actually does make a difference for cities to do this and so, but that's mm -hmm. not the point. The point, point for me is like, we don't have much control over what's going on over there, but mm. what's going on over there does really affect how we feel about other members of our community, mm -hmm. especially when they don't believe what we believe. And so right. that's one example of like a really negative local impact of a global crisis mm -hmm. that we don't have a lot of control over, but we have a lot of opinions about. Right. And, and so the point of this proposal I made is like, we should just get people together to talk about these things that are dividing us, mm -hmm. not to try and architect a solution, because we have no power over it, or to even come to agreement, but just to understand the impact on each one of us of these of these conflicts. 
Yeah. Like, why do we all have such strong opinions about about what's going on in like Ukraine and Russia or what's going on in Israel and Palestine or you know, you know things that may happen you know, AI climate change like big big things that may happen soon mm -hmm. may not happen soon but they're they're destroying relationships now and right. what can we do in terms of understanding what's operating in the heart of the other without mm -hmm. trying to convince anyone or even agree with them but just trying to understand their story about it a little bit better right. that would then lead to me like having a different visceral reaction when I walk by my neighbor with the Trump sign. Because mm -hmm. that's the experience I want. I want an experience of like beloved community. Oh, I love everyone. And when I see certain things, I don't feel that way. Right. And I imagine like someone with um a strong like ethnocentric or racist viewpoint would have a similar feeling where like nobody wants to feel antipathy when they see someone just based on what they look like maybe maybe we do because of the way we we're raised or the experiences we've had yep. but we'd probably prefer not to have that experience and one right. way to do that is only see people that look like us but if that's not an option which it's not anymore like what are other ways of doing that yeah thanks for sharing that Anko. i think that 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 resonates a lot of what you said resonates and i think in a lot of ways when people have opinions and hundred percent, whatever happens globally impacts us for all sorts of reasons. There might be some, some element of that conflict that feels unfair and maybe fairness is an important part of our identity. And maybe that emerges from a place of having had something unfair happen to us. Like there's all of these things that, um, that pull an emotion or, you know, that pull on a wire, if you will, for us to have a certain reaction. And I think expression of frustration is, is easy. What's hard is to try and understand why you're feeling that way. And so of course we have opinions because we don't know what else to do. We're feeling helpless. We feel like we have no control. We feel like we don't have a voice. Yet we'll spend hours watching a Netflix show where one person changed the world and we're so freaking inspired by that. And going, oh, like, can't believe this one person. And if all they were doing was like moving a, a couple of books around and look, they they changed the dynamic of how the war panned out. We feel inspired by those stories. And yet when it comes to us, we assume that we have no control. So I would argue that everyone has we yeah we may not have control over the overall outcome but we have these micro levels of control and one of the one of the most effective ways for us i feel or i believe to to transform conflict is for us to reclaim a little bit of that control my voice matters if if i can if i can say something and if I can have others understand in this like dialogue thing that you're doing, and if we can as a group community come together and at least have a conversation about impact, that helps us channel all of that anger and opinions into something constructive. Let's talk about the impact and let's see what control we have. We may not be able to change the course of the war, but at least we've reclaimed who we are as a community. We've built some cohesion in our community. So yeah, like I, I think there is always a little bit of control as opposed to a default of ah, I got no control here. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here. I'd like to go back to something you mentioned earlier. Sure. And this is like part of my education, right? It's just like some of these concepts are a little bit new to me. And so now when I hear them, I'm like, oh, that might be new to other people. And so I want to go into it. Yeah. You said trauma informed. And sure. I'd love for you to just go over that a little bit. And then I just want to talk mm -hmm. about that. Sure. Yeah. So trauma informed um, essentially means, this is fascinating because I don't have a 30 second elevator pitch, but what does it mean to be trauma informed? But trauma informed, a, a trauma Approaching something from a trauma lens, a trauma-informed way, means reframing what is wrong with you to what has happened to you. 
So it allows us to build an understanding of humans, their reactions, their uh, their anger, their frustration, their disassociation, or whatever's happening in the moment with this uh, space of empathy to say, they might have experienced some really bad shit that's drawn them to this. There might have been significant trauma in their background that has resulted in some significant impacts, and here's what we're seeing. So that can translate into how we engage with each other. It can translate into how we have conversations. So as an example, if I have to interview, if I have to interview someone for a project and it's supposed to be a really upbeat interview, no big deal, um, or let's, yeah, let's take our example. So say, you know, we're doing this podcast and um, I have a history as an example, like let's pretend that I was tortured in a small room that was like an interrogated under this light, no windows kind of set up. So even though our our interaction may be incredibly positive and lighthearted, and all we're talking about is how beautiful the ocean is, by being in that setting, I'm triggered. I can't I just can't even process what's going on because in my mind, I've gone back to that interrogation room. So a trauma-informed approach for you to be trauma-informed would mean that you recognize that I'm not able to participate in that interview in that way because of what has happened to me. And a, a trauma-informed approach to that same interview would be you asking, hey, where would you like to meet? Here's what we're going to be talking about. What feels good for you? And we decide to go for a hike and do this interview as opposed to in a dingy room with no windows and a giant light yeah. over the two of our heads yeah. so it can be something global and it can be something very little in every in every conversation and any engagement that we have with another person so we look at you know improving our uh, practice if you will to do it in a trauma-informed way so that we're doing no harm no further harm to people yeah so the thing that's tripping me out about that um and so i went to this and i wrote about this in the newsletter so the people who have read that will maybe know this but i went to a talk by this guy henry Yampolsky, who i also interviewed recently and yeah henry's on, awesome yeah super awesome and he and he presented this um that study with the mice and the cherry blossoms right and so i'll just go over it quickly for the listeners Please, which is yeah. and I, I just um you know, I've I interviewed a couple people in the last year who talked about intergenerational trauma. And I was like, oh, that's a kind of a cool idea, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't really sold. <laughs> and then I saw this study and I was just like, oh man, we're hoes. <laughs> but the basic experiment is that they take these mice, and I just want to make a little apology to the mice. Um I think it's horrible the things that we do with the mice. And I really think we benefit a lot from the things we do with the mice. And I think we're going to keep doing that to the mice. But I just want to say I'm not um, not entirely comfortable with it. Anyhow, these mice, bless their hearts, they, they give them some sort of traumatic association with the smell of cherry blossoms, like electric shock to the smell of cherry blossoms. And then the mice have kids, and the kids have this association. And so it's like, oh... Ah, lame. But I'm kind mm -hmm. of like, you know, in my little skepticism about intergenerational trauma, I'm like, well, yeah, the, the parents probably just told the kids, like, dude, get away from that cherry blossom smell. It's gnarly. And then they do the other thing via with, they do the next experiment with IVF. And so the parents have never met the kids. or the, And so it's, it's totally IVF. Parents have never met the kids. And for three generations, the mice have this trauma response to the smell of cherry blossom mm -hmm. which they've never experienced themselves the electric shock or no one ever told them about it mm -hmm. and that i like couldn't i can no longer escape this this now <laughs> and and then at the end of henry's talk he's like okay so it's important to have trauma-informed mediation this and that but given what we know about intergenerational trauma from this study and imagining others like it perhaps 
-hmm. we're all traumatized. So like every interaction has to be trauma informed because who has not had some sort of trauma if you go back three generations in your family, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we have, <laughs> I mean, that sounds like hopeless, but I'm going to turn that into something resilient. Yeah. Yeah. Based. Do it. So Somia, resilience that comes from fasting. <laughs> Thank you. So absolutely. I think like we, we all have trauma and yes, there's intergenerational trauma. There's lots of, lots of really fascinating literature, lots of really fascinating research on, on intergenerational trauma. Two people can have different responses to an incident. For one person, they may be, a, you know, a, a trauma response, and for the other person, they may not experience it that way. So one, I just want to acknowledge that it can be different experiences for different people. Um, what's also important is that we do have the ability to build our resilience to be able to recover from trauma. So you know, I, I know what my triggers are and I'm learning new and new triggers emerge every now and then, but I I'm incorporating techniques in just my everyday life to be able to ground myself and to find ways to stay in my thinking brain when I'm feeling triggered. So I have all of these tools. So in addition to possibly passing on my traumatized DNA, if you will, I do have the option and the ability to pass on all of these tools. So 100%, you know, all of our conversations, our engagements have should be trauma informed, because we should just be decent human beings towards each other, period. So we can be more deliberate, more intentional about how we engage with each other. But also, I just want to acknowledge that we do have a lot of power and ability to, to recover. And we do all the time. Um, you know, things that we've experienced as kids or as young adults or as adults or everyday life, we can recover and we can, we can really find ways to, um, to build that strength, to reclaim that strength and lean on each other when we need that. And if, if I'm, if I come at my life from a trauma informed way, chances are I would come to you in that same way mm -hmm. like I would wonder what's happened to you that's you know creating this significant response so there's a lot of room there for us to build resilience as as people as communities as families uh yeah as as countries so there's there's opportunity there for us to do things in a good way that is very hopeful and I appreciate that and and I didn't think it was necessarily hopeless that we all have this intergenerational trauma but it but it was it was just like oh yeah this whole trauma informed mm -hmm. thing this is like this is relevant this is this is not just like oh i work with this really disaffected population i should learn about the trauma informed technique it's like oh i interact with the human i should yeah. know about the trauma informed technique yeah but yeah Absolutely. i love i love that the balancing of that that we're also learning skills that we can pass on as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's lots of, um, and the chapter when we had first connected, I told you that chapter on trauma informed impact assessment was coming. So it's out. I'll send you a link. Okay. Um, but, you know, I talk about what are the principles of doing work in a trauma informed way. And when you read it, like it's all very intuitive, it's not rocket science, you know, principles of reciprocity, humility knowing that your worldview is not the only worldview in this world there are different ways of knowing and learning so there's an inherent approach of humility that is required in doing work in a trauma-informed way love it i mean what, what do we need more of humility <laughs> <laughs> what else do we need we're done yeah, yeah. <laughs> fantastic uh, I just want to, before we close here, uh, I just want to give you an opportunity, if you have a desire to do so, to share a story. Ooh. Hmm. Any story? Like, I need a topic. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> I, can I can provide a topic. <laughs> Maybe about... I love, I oh. love stories. Okay, here, I got one. So 
Um, I shared this one actually quite quite recently. We were uh, I was delivering some training in trauma informed uh, trauma informed impact assessment to a group, and um, one of the conversations that we were having were around um, uh, expectations, like how do we know if we're doing how do we know if we're doing things in a trauma informed way? Like how do we know if we're doing things in a good way, especially when we're working with traumatized communities or traumatized individuals, like, how do I know if I'm getting it right? And I didn't have an answer to that. And I just thought, you know, I'll uh, reflect on this based on our expectation of feedback. Like as humans, we want to know that we're, we're on the right track. Like, is this a good exchange right now? Are we getting meaning from this exchange? So the story I shared there is what I'll share now. So my parents are like there's this, they're very loving towards each other, like very expressive. Every time my mom gets ready, my dad will be like, oh, my tea you're looking good. So they're just very loving towards each other. Like I've never seen them hug, like physical affection is just not a thing. But this is what my dad will do. He'll go right like beside my mom and put his hand on her shoulder. And this is, this is all he'll do. And she would like, just leave me alone. Like, what is it? And she'll say to him, instead of doing this, why don't you take more time to tell me my food is good when I cook for you? So I'm watching this exchange unfold. And my dad says to her, well, Mati, like every time you feed me, I burp. I have a good nap after. Like, what else do you need? I take care of you. And what was hilarious in that exchange to me was the difference in expectations. Like here's this very loving couple they clearly adore each other and they have all these expressions of love but she has always wanted him to you know first bite say mm, this is delicious so where I took that story then with this group that I was sharing it with was look you're you're never going to really know but maybe what's important is to think about what your expectation is and then take a step further back and reflect on, you know, when I was in community, someone came up to me and said, don't put the cedar leaves this way, put them this way. And maybe that is an indicator that I'm starting to be accepted because someone's feeling comfortable enough to come tell me I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. And just start building your awareness beyond what your expectation is. No one's going to come up to you and say, uncle, like, you're the man like there's no one else doing this work better than you i mean if they do that's awesome <laughs> you know it's in the laughter and it's in the conversation and it's in the staying in touch like those are good indicators that we're on the right path so yeah yeah very Be beautiful thing. i have two takeaways from your story which i really enjoyed and i was gonna ask for a story about food so you you oh yeah you read my time. mind but it's no the food was there it's like totally in the, in the best way one, one is that, yeah, I think what I want, what I'm trying to cultivate is that comfort in the relationship where people mm. can share what they need. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really what I, I want to cultivate. So it's, so I don't, cause I don't, and this is just part of my, um, my gift or my privilege or whatever it is. I don't feel a lot of insecurity about that. Like, and I'm, but I, I have friends who are always like, oh, did I say the right thing? Is this okay? Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, what is, and I, I'm just, I'm just knowing that we're all going to make lots of mistakes all the time. And it doesn't really matter as long as we're working on the substructure, like the infrastructure that allows us to like share those things and, mm -hmm. and correct them and improve, right? So it's like an improvement cycle. Then every mistake is just an opportunity for like deeper knowledge of, of the other person. Yeah, and the second I thing is like, that. oh, yeah, thank no, you. I was just going to acknowledge that, I, that I really like that. I think that's, that's beautiful. Thank you. And the second thing is, where does your mom live? Because I will go and I will appreciate <laughs> that food immediately, <laughs> very vocally. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. She's in the whole of Pakistan. <laughs> you are better. always welcome anytime. Oh. oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And she's a phenomenal cook. So we're, we're, you know, us kids, we're coaching our dad, like, Baba, come on, just it's a little sound, you can make it, try it. <laughs> so we'll see.
But he, I mean, we'll see if he ever does. He's got a good point, though. He's like, I, I burp every <laughs> time. I burp. <laughs> and I take a nap after. That's how much I eat. Oh, God, Bubba. It's so good. It's so know. good. <laughs> I, I remember going to my aunt's house in, um, in Amdavad. I spent about five years there as an adult in India, just living and learning different things. And I would say thank you a lot for the food. Mm. And she's like, she's like, dude, I don't, I don't think she said dude, but in my mind, in my mind, she's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's like, dude, <laughs> don't say thank you. Right. She's like, she's like, this is how it works. I make the food and you eat it. Mm. And if you eat it, if you eat enough, I will be happy. Right. And like you, you could say all the thank yous you want, but if you're not asking for seconds, I am not going to be happy. I love that. See, <laughs> like different expectations of expression. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And my, my parents would always say that you never, if someone is offering you more food, you never say no. That's very disrespectful. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, but what if I don't want to eat this much? And they're like, don't load your plate up the first time you're going up there, kiddo. Like, <laughs> just... Just that that is yourself. such a, a rookie move, huh? <laughs> to take a bunch of food on the first serving. You're just like, oh man, you're yeah. asking for it. Like, and then you learn from experience that okay, I gotta eat just this much more. So I'm gonna watch it next time I load on the plate. Yeah. With with this same family, there was a similar thing where there's this it's like a it's like a long-term negotiation of like how mm. much you're gonna eat. And so <laughs> they give you like the first rotli, you know, the first chapati. Yeah. And then when they're about to give you the second one, like normally I'm just like, yeah, load it on, you know, yeah. you've got to start saying no right yeah. away as like the, the theater. So that you're mm -hmm. like, no. And then they're like, have it. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then the yeah. third one, you're, like, <laughs> you're like, you're like, no, 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 I can't have any more. They're like, have it. Like, oh, okay. And then by the time you, <laughs> if you don't want the fifth one, because it's the fourth time you've said no, they'll actually accept it. Otherwise yeah. you'd have to get to nine before they would accept yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that you get that. It's true. You have to start negotiating like right away. Even yeah. when if someone is starting to dish out your first, you'd be like, oh, that's so much. Thank you. I want to make sure that I leave room for all these other 20 things in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's an art, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, lots of lots of good things can happen around food. 100%. Yeah. Ah, yeah. oh. Beautiful. Well, thank thank you so much. I really I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure, Ankur. Thank you for the opportunity. This was I had a, I had a really great time. Thanks for having me here. You're very welcome. All right. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Enjoy some food. Yeah. Thus concludes another episode of the Ten Thousand Heroes Show. I'm Ankur Shah Delight. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today. And if you like the show. Don't be afraid. Send me a fat wad of cash. Just kidding. Just kidding. I mean, you can. But really, if you like the show and it made a difference in your life, send it to someone you know and like in the hope that it'll make a positive impact in their life. Because that's what this is all about.